Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the Times Cheltenham Science Festival uh, on this lovely Sunday morning. Uh, today we're going to be hearing from Rory Wilson, who for the past 30 years has been designing high-tech uh, special tags and attaching them to wild animals to get an insight into their day-to-day -day lives. Um, he started with penguins, moved on to armadillos, and has worked with sloths and even sharks. And uh, today he's going to show us some incredible footage and reveal some of the secrets that uh, these animals have revealed to him. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Swansea University for their kind sponsorship of this event. Only 40% of uh, the money raised by the Cheltenham Festivals comes from ticket sales and the rest of it has to come from sponsors and partners. And uh, it's places like Swansea University that allow us to put on such an innovative and exciting festival. So uh, without further ado, I'd like you to give a really warm welcome to Rory Wilson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about animal diaries. I'm from Swansea University um, in South Wales. And I suppose the most important thing for you to know at the moment is that I work as part of a team. I'm, it's going to seem as if I do lots of zany, wonderful things. Um, but in fact, there's lots of people within biosciences that form part of this team. And I suppose the nice thing about Swansea University is not just biosciences, we work with engineers and mathematicians and computer scientists and so on. And within the team and without it, and with people all around the world working on these fantastic animals. So um, it's not just me. I, these are just, this is a group photo of, uh, we took at last, the last tea break. Um, if you had a house that looked out on this view and you were used to eating your breakfast and seeing these things there... Um, and one morning there were fewer, and the next morning there were fewer and fewer still, you'd say, I say, darling, what's happened to the thingamabobs? They don't seem to be as common here as they used to be. Um, and you'd worry about it, perhaps. Uh, you'd certainly notice it. The interesting thing is that there are a lot of species around the world that live in places you can't see and aren't in front of your bedroom window uh, that are doing just that. And if you wanted to stop it, the first place you'd have to go is to figure out, um, wh well, what it is that those animals need and what it is that they're not getting, okay? Um, that's not so easy, because there are animals around the world, watch the left-hand corner, there are animals around the world that don't like to be seen, and therefore are very secretive, uh, and they're difficult to study, and there are animals around the world that are quite happy to be seen, but they go to places where they're extremely difficult to follow, penguins, for example, and that's uh, how I started my work. And so if you have a problem uh, with an animal, and even if you don't, to understand what an animal does, then um, you have to somehow find a mechanism to find out what's important for these animals. And my solution, a long time ago, is to say, I can't follow penguins, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put something on the penguin and it'll just record what they do, and then the penguin will come back, I'll take off the uh, tag, and then, I'll let, and then I'll be able to find out. Um, that was a few years ago, um, 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. Um, and in the middle of this time, or actually around about 2006, was it, 2005, they, I wanted to create a tag that was more important than just stuff for penguins. And um, I call this tag the Daily Diary, and I was able to do it, actually, because of... Uh, Rolex, the, the watch people that, that gave me uh, a financial boost to be able to realise it. And now, uh, with these concepts and working with great people, and this is the latest version of the tag created by Mark Holton, who's uh, one of our whiz kid engineers who does all his stuff in the attic at two o'clock in the morning. Um, we now have a piece of complex electronic technology that looks like this. It weighs 1.8 grams without the batteries, and it records everything you can imagine. It does acceleration, it does magnetometry, you know, m magnetic fields around the Earth, it does temperature, humidity, light, and it does it on lots of channels and it does it many times a second, like 40 times a second on each channel. And so that's the clever piece of electronics, and the idea is you put it on an animal, and if this thing continues to work, ah, there we are, it has a very variable press thing. You have to sometimes press it very hard and sometimes not so much. Um, if we take this tag and we put it in appropriate housing, and this is where part of the team works also important, that thing you see on the left is a housing for a carnivore, and it's a computer-generated image of that housing. So that's not a real housing at all. It looks very cool. Um, 
But we can make that housing by taking the computer image. Darren Taylor does this. He's been helping us. And we can print it in 3D out of plastic and then slot the diary inside, our daily diary inside. Um, and we can... The, importance about, the important thing about that is we can print it so that if a badger bites it, it won't break. Or we can make it in a different shape so that if it's an animal like a gannet um, that likes to dive in the sea or something that's bothered about hydrodynamics or aerodynamics, we can make it really streamlined. So that's an important part of the whole tag thing. And here actually is an example of one of the very, very early tags on a Gen 2 penguin. You can see it, um, oh, look, the sort of wind blowing everything. Um, uh, black, because animals like tags to be the same colour as they are, streamlined and everything else. And that's a manifestation, a typical example, rather larger than the version we use today, of this daily diary. Um, so what can the tag do? I won't bore you with the electronics or the, or the um, sensors in it, but in a nutshell, it can tell us the fine-scale animal movement. So if I were wearing it and I walked across here, it would be able to do, tell, tell me later exactly what I'd done, how many steps I'd taken, and so on. Where I'd gone, it will give me my behaviour, so I'm standing here wittering on inanely. Um, it will tell, me, tell us about the energy expenditure, which is a really important thing for animals, because they like to conserve energy. And it'll tell us about the environment through which the animal's moving. Um, so the things we need to do to use this tag are, first of all, to put it on. This is me in the field working in Argentina um, with some of the good people out there, uh, Juan Emilio Sala, Flavio Quintana, Agustino Gomez Laich from the Centro Patagonico. And that's not, that's not a T-shirt design on the front, that's penguin design on the front. Um, <laughs> And so you go up and you've got your penguin in a nest and you take it off the nest. Anyone who thinks that penguins are cuddly needs to pick up a real penguin and they bite quite hard. And then you put them between your knees and they go into the sort of zen-like state. They can't see, cover the eyes. Uh, and they sort of go to sleep and think something strange is happening. And you put the tag on. And just so you know, because people are dead interested in this, how you do this, you put some tape, some special tape, slide it underneath the feathers. Um, th there's a there's a cardboard cutout, so you put it in exactly the right place. You plonk the device on, this is one of the very old ones, and then you wrap the tape on um, so that it's held in place. And by the time you've done that, that this is a Magellanic penguin, um, the one on the left is wearing the tag, and it's just put on, um, sticking it to a few feathers. And when you get it back, you just reverse the process, and the bird comes away having had a, the device stuck to it, but no glue stuck to the feathers or anything like that. So that's, that's the easy thing. And it's the same principle really for almost all birds on which we put the tags. This is a condor. It's the back of a condor. It's getting more than one tag on it. Um, Sergio Lambertucci and Emily Shepard and their team are working on condors. I'll talk about them in a second. Um, that's what they look like when they're not resting on the table. Uh, you notice on the left, actually, that, again, the head is covered. That's a sort of important thing. And then, of course, if you're going to put tags on, on things like whales, like sperm whales, then you have to think a bit laterally. You obviously can't go picking them up and putting them on a table. So, uh, as you can see in the corner, it's got suction cups. You have a long pole, and you put it at the end of a long pole. And when the whale comes to the surface to breathe, this was done in the Azores, you stick it on, you push it on, and then uh, it's stuck. And then the whale goes and does its thing. Um, and that's great. But, of course, there are some animals, some marine animals, that don't come to the surface. So you can't just do that. And this is a whale shark. Um, this is work that, we, that we're doing with Brad Norman, who's a whale shark expert in, in Australia. Works in a place called, I'd call it Ningaloo Reef, but he calls it Ningaloo Reef. Um, and the way to put a tag on there is to... Um, you, he's got a special gun, and you can see the tag there, and it clamps it round the fin. Um, that's me in the background pretending to help. Um, but noticing the size of the tail. And the other thing is, of course, not all animals are as amenable as whale sharks. Whale sharks eat plankton, and that's a good thing if you're swimming with them. This is a white shark, work done by Adrian Gleiss and his colleagues um, in California, and white sharks apparently can ruin your whole day, uh, <laughs> so you shouldn't really try and swim with them. He actually, Adrian said to me when we were in Ningaloo Reef, he said, you, want to worry, you don't want to worry about the sharks you can see, it's the ones you can't see you need to worry about. So whenever I don't see a shark, I'm supposed to worry. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the way to solve the problem with the 
white sharks is simply to put the tag in a lump of rotting meat and chuck it out there, and then they eat it. And so the tag goes inside them. It's not quite as good as sticking it on the fin, but it gives us quite a lot of information. And then after three weeks, the shark spits it out, and we pick it up. So teeth are a problem in a general sense. Elephant seals, small teeth, big mouths, lots of muscle, give you a nasty bite. And if you do this, again, this is working with the Argentinians in Patagonia, Claudia Campagna, and this Marci, uh, who's our vet, and you basically have to sedate them. There comes a point when you say, this is getting silly, we need to sedate them. So there's an elephant seal being sedated with a rag over its head so that it's uh, not disturbed. And um, this is after it's been attached with the devices, and it's coming out of the sedation thinking... It's got a terrible hangover and everything's a bit woozy, but uh, it's fine. The Daily Diary's on the back. There's a satellite transmitter on the front. And, of course, anything that bites, seriously bites, including badgers, very topical at the moment. This is work done in Oxford with uh, David McDonnell and his team, who's actually putting the tag on there. Anything that bites, that's inside a badger's front end. Um, definite case for... Um, for avoiding that. So are there any dentists here? Um, anyway, or we're still this. This is an Arabian leopard um, for some work that we were looking at in Amman. There's 160 Arabian leopards left, and this, these are not my fingers. And, and the Arabian leopard was, wasn't just sleeping, it was sedated. So. Uh, um, and, I, and I really have to put in, so I've put in, a, in terms of putting the tag on, uh, some of the extremes, and this is one of the nicest extremes. This is work being done in Costa Rica, with Judy Arroyo um, from the Sloth Sanctuary. It's my daughter, Gwendolyn, on the right-hand side, and this is Becky Cliff on the left-hand side, putting a tag onto a sloth. And it is a sort of semi-tame sloth called Sidwiggy. Uh, and the tag is put... There's Gwendolyn with a knife. She's not feeling murderous. She's just about to use it to lift the fur, to slide the tape underneath. And basically, Sidwiggy and sloths do this. They just hug tighter. If you, want to, if you think animals are huggable, go for the sloth, because they just hug. Um, and then uh, here's the device gone on. And they've not quite put it on right, so Sid Wiggy says, there's something, it's just pulling, it's just pulling one of my hairs at the back and actually trying to um, resolve that problem. Uh, but there it is, stuck in place. So the perfect animal to put a tag on. And then, of course, you've put the tag on, you do all the recording, and because these tags record so much information... Uh, uh, per second, typically, well, on every channel, maybe 40 pieces of data every second and maybe 10, 15 channels. You can do the maths yourself. Um, they record the information, and so we have to get them back. And this is where animals lie on tags, and it's, it's okay if you can get them back and they, they come back to the colony. All you have to do is roll them over to get it off. Uh, but in a lot of cases, things like sharks and whales, then they have to pop off and they float around and they transmit their position to you, and you can pick them up. And then you pick up the tag, you connect it to a mega-powerful, wonderful, extremely hip computer, <laughs> download the data, and you're faced with this horrible mess. And you say, well, this will tell me everything I need to know, Would, if I could only fathom it. And that's where um, you can do the standard graph, which is plotting information against time. This is, this is information from an albatross. And you'll be relieved to know that on a Sunday morning you're not going to be taken through this. Uh, the... I suppose the most important thing about it is if we're to understand data like that, we need really clever software, and we've got a really whiz kitty computer scientist who helps us with this in the team, Ed Grundy, and he generates fabulous visualizations of the stuff that we record to let us know what's, what's going on. So that's how we work with the data. And again, you don't have to understand any of this, you just have to look at it, and you can see the patterns and think, yes, there's some cool stuff going on. Okay. What I'm going to do today, having given you a bit of background, is I'm going to take you through some tales from the Daily Diary. Some, it's like the idea is you have the tag, you put it on your animal, it does what a diary should do, it records every single movement all the time, irrespective of what your animal does. It's a perfect diary. And so uh, one of the interesting things about this is when you put tags on these animals, you often put them on for one reason and you discover something else. Um, but it's very important because it gives you a very clear picture of where the animal's operating in space and the sort of things they need to operate well. So I'm going to pull a few chapters out of the, of the diaries that have been worn by animals and just make a couple of cases for you. This one is, is part of a project again done by Sergio Lambertucci in Bariloche in Argentina with Emily Shepard. 
and it's about how air movement affects where condors fly. So condors, Andean condors, uh, you'll know about them. They're really majestic birds. They fly around in the high airs of the of the mountain, mountains. And if that's your romantic image about condors, and it is, they are truly majestic, uh, and you wish to keep that image, I'd like you to close your eyes now. Because that is what a condor looks like close up. Okay? Uh, that's not someone shot at this. That hole's there on purpose, um, just above its beak. It's for helping it breathe. They've got these... They're fairly disgusting-looking birds close up. But then if you ate rotting sheep and stuck your head inside them a lot, you'd probably look fairly disgusting as well. Um, um, but one of the things that's come out of the, of, of the condor work um, previous to our work was scientists have done some work and they said, well, it's a strange thing. These birds spend their time flying around in the high mountain airs and yet, theoretically, they can't even maintain level flight by flapping. So even if they work really hard, they're still going to sink by a foot a second. So that's a bit of an anathema because they clearly are flying and they're going up. And this is a trace from the altitude that's taken off the Daily Diary uh, over just 20 minutes. And you can see, you just put something in, you can see there are periods where they go up clearly and down. See, so very clear periods of up and very clear periods of down. And if we put next to that <clears throat> the compass data, um, I suppose the interesting thing, the, the important thing to note is you see these blocks here. Those blocks mean that the bird has gone round in circles. And so if we superimpose that, we can see that where there are circles, the bird's been going up. And where there are no circles, the bird's just been sort of travelling in one, one direction. And in fact, what, what transpires is that these birds are using thermals. These are columns of air that rise at an incredible rate. Um, I think we've had birds going up at, going up at 40 kilometres an hour when they get in a thermal. So the columns of air generated by the sun hitting the ground and then it goes blasting up and it's like a lift. So the birds go into these thermals and they get taken up and they go to the top of the thermal and then they glide down to the next one. And that's how they manage to fly at all. There's an animation of this um, where, where data from the Daily Diary has been taken and superimposed so that the full track of the bird or a section of the full track of the bird can be superimposed on the Andes here. And if we could just run that... You can see the trace starts on the left-hand side. It's colour-coded. It flies along a ridge. And then this bit on the right where it goes round in circles, that's the bird going up in, this, in the thermal. And then the next bit's where it's gliding down um, over the mountains to the, next, to the next section. I should just say that using this technology and using Ed Grundy's cleverness, we can take the movements of these animals and we can plonk them in Google Earth. So we can see what the animal did in the place it did it using Google Earth technology. So, so that's rather fun. While I'm on the subject of condors, I just... Because this, this talk's going to seem as if everything works absolutely perfectly, and I just thought it would be time to be a little bit of, of confession that it doesn't always work as we intend. So this is a trace from a condor as well. It's an acceleration trace over time, and... If you look at the first bit here, there's nothing happening. There's an acceleration sensor that basically tells you about whether an animal's in a particular orientation and if it's moving around. And you can see where the blue line is, not, not much going on, so the bird was clearly standing still. Then there's another period where there's some funny movement going on, and then another period still, there it is, um, where the movement changes fundamentally. And if you interpret that movement... Um, and put it together with other data, like data on the altitude, you can see, yes, there's this sort of period of stillness, and then the last bit at the end accompanies a radical drop in altitude. And I have to also say that the tag stopped recording after this radical drop, drop of altitude. So what? What does that mean? Well, something like this. I've tried to put this in a cartoon for you. So the bird's on, the, on its ledge, on the cliff, and all of a sudden something terrible happens, it falls off, and that's the end of the bird, and that's why the tag stopped. But I'm pleased to say that there was no bird with the tag at the bottom of the cliff. There was a tag at the bottom of the cliff. Um, and actually, what really happened was this. The bird was sitting there quite happily, and they said, there's something on my back that's not been put on terribly well by Emily. So I'm going to pull it off and chuck it down and break the tag. Um, we can still get the data back, but... Uh, it was supposed to be on for longer. Okay. 
Sticking with birds, um, we all know a lot about birds, and, and one of the things we know about, if you have bird tables, is you will notice that these small birds, a lot of them, when they fly, they go, voo, voo. they do this sort of um, uh, powering up and gliding down sort of pattern. And the work we were doing with whale sharks, with Brad Norman in Ingaloo Reef, which was actually to try and understand a bit more about whale sharks. Whale sharks are very poorly understood. We don't know what they do for most of the year. We know that they're threatened. They are, we also know they're the biggest fish in the sea. I need to explain to you how big the biggest fish in the sea is. When I first saw a whale shark, it was with Brad, and the way, you, the way we equip them with the tags is there's a spotter plane. You're on a big boat, and there's a spotter plane. It flies around. It says... Okay, there's a, there's a whale shark uh, down two, two, heading 270 degrees, go out. And so we jump into the zodiac and we burn out to where the whale shark is about to arrive because the spotter plane says it's heading in this direction. You all jump in the water, you've got your snorkel, Brad's there with this sort of attaching mechanism. And he said, Rory, I've got to tell you, don't look down, don't look down, look along. They swim near to the surface. And in Ingaloo Reef, it's extraordinary, beautiful crystal clear waters. Um, and uh, nothing can prepare you for a fish that it can be the size of a bus that swims towards you, um, sometimes with its mouth open, like this. Um, and it made, it made me hyperventilate in, into my snorkel. And I'm a biologist, so I know they eat plankton and small fish, but you have to keep saying this to yourself. They eat plankton, they eat plankton, they eat plankton. And try and swim like anything that looks like nothing but, you know, not plankton. Um, so, yeah, that was part of that study. It was, a, it was an amazing experience. And the idea behind the study was to try and find out what these whale sharks are doing in and around Ningaloo Reef. They hang around for, for periods of up to six months, and then they just disappear. And one of the things that came out of this study was this. If we can just make this run, this is now, a, uh, again, an Ed Grundy-generated 3D virtual reality representation of what a whale shark did when it was wearing the tag. So everything you see is taken from the tag. The, the pitch is speeded up because whale sharks do everything slowly. Um, so the way it was rocking, going down in the water uh, at depth, and then all these tail beats, every single one of these tail beats is a tail beat as recorded by the tag. The, tag, the, the Daily Diary gives you so much information. You can do individual tail beats, whether they're pitching and rolling, and the heights they go to, at the depths they go to, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, of course, whale sharks go to, to 1,000 metres underwater, so it's really useful to have this. You're not going to go with them. And the important thing, I suppose, to notice about this is the whale shark is powering up, using its tail to power it up, and then it's actually gliding down. And if you look over the track for where it's been, it's going up and going... It's powering up and gliding down, and powering up and gliding down. And sharks are, are sort of like water versions of aeroplanes. They get lift from their pectoral fins, so they just glide down and then power up, and it's very analogous to the small birds that we see flying to and from our bird tails, which do this, powering up, and then <clears throat> a lot of them do the, never mind gliding down, they close their wings and plummet. But the, the important thing, I suppose, to remember is that scientists working on this for birds, for small birds, have said, oh, we believe this is an energy-saving mechanism. Energy, making energy savings is really important to animals and uh, any mechanism that they can invoke or that they can adopt which saves them energy means they have to eat less and, and their lives get better quality. And this is the mechanism that birds use and astonishingly the biggest fish in the sea, and no one thought that they would do this, does exactly the same thing. And actually we discovered that not just the whale shark does this and this whole behaviour helps explain why it can migrate so far but the elef elephant seal does this as well. And um, some fur seals do this. So lots of marine animals do this sort of undulating, um, sort of wave-like flight, whether they're underwater or as the birds are in the air. Um, and while we're on the subject of elephant seals, I, I, I'd like to officially give them an image change today. Uh, you've seen this sort of animal on, on um, television many times. It's uh, not the loveliest thing. And they lie there on the beaches and they look sort of like someone's taken a pizza and pushed it out even further. And they lie there and they grunt and fart and blow at you. And 
they look fairly ungainly. But of course, this is just the small time when we see them. If you look at an elephant seal dive, this is taken from the Daily Diary, a single elephant seal dive, the first thing to note is it's amazingly intricate. The second thing to note is if I put a scale in effectively and I put the light into a cord, most of the dive, they're in pitch black. And they're diving to 800 metres, a kilometre underwater, and they're operating in these areas. I'll just take that out. And if we just concentrate on a small section and pull this bit out, because this is a section where the animal has been catching prey. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Um, what I've done to try and get you appreciate that elephant seals aren't just those ghastly things that lie in a pizza-like p- potato format um, under the water, uh, um, on the beach. I've, I've taken a few snapshots of them as they're underwater. I've had to do them myself, a little bit of artist- artistry, but there you are. There's that one, and then doing that, and the next thing, cray, and of course, they're, they're actually catching squid, and so uh, the, this, this ballerina-type stuff that goes on underwater for elephant seals, they're, they're moving it up to 20 kilometres an hour, they're powering up and down in this complete back blackness, catching squid, we're not quite sure how. So uh, no one would call a whale a big fat potato. Um, because they don't lie on land and look like big, flat, fat potatoes. Uh, But we do it with elephant seals, and I think it's time to change the imagery. Um, Elephant seals are big animals. They eat a lot. They're major predators, I suppose, and they're going to be impacting the ecosystem in the areas they eat. And you don't have to be big to impact the ecosystem. And penguins are not particularly big, but there are reasons to believe they impact the ecosystem, and they play a part in that ecosystem. So... Fish, if they eat fish, the amount of fish they take is going to be important for the balance of the ecosystem. And I'd like to run a case, a daily diary case, of you four penguins for work that I did in Cabo Verginis in southern Argentina about 10 years ago now, and dreamt up a piece of kit to go with the daily diary, which uh, allows us to monitor exactly how many fish penguin eat, how big they are when they take them, and where they've taken them. And... This is the Magellanic Penguin. That's an African penguin. It's the Magellanic Penguin on which the study was done. And I'd like you to look at this graph. I know graphs are tough on Sunday morning, but take a look at this. This is... Concentrate on this circle. This is the graph of one of those penguins eating food. The amount, total amount of food it ate over time. Okay, so after seven hours, it had eaten 2.4 kilograms. And that might not sound a lot until I tell you that they are actually four kilograms heavy themselves. So that bird, an average human, if we say we're 70 kilograms, would be eating 45 kilograms of something like fish or hamburgers or something um, over seven hours. And to give that some sense of uh, normality, not that the top of this is anything normal at all, world record hamburger eat-off, which I looked up on the web, 103 burgers in eight minutes. That is nothing short of disgusting. Um, But anyway, remarkable. If you were trying to do what that penguin did, then you'd start breakfast at 9 in the morning, and then by 12.30, you'd have eaten... I think when you eat the hamburgers, the hamburger equivalent of fish, I think you don't have to eat the lettuce or the bun with them. You can just eat the hamburgers. And when you finished at four, four o'clock in the afternoon, which is the period that we're talking about, you will have had to have eaten 403 hamburgers. Okay? That is serious. That's a serious amount of hamburger. And, of course, if you talk about the Magellanic penguin population in Argentina, which is about two million birds, if they're eating that equivalent of fish, that's a lot of fish. It's an important thing to know uh, for the environment. Um, and it's quite clear that penguins, therefore, can, they're perfectly capable of eating huge amounts of fish. But we did concentrate on the fatty out there. Um, And there are other penguins that eat very few fish and seem to be doing just as well. So what's going on here? Well, I need to take you into a sort of dissection mode very quickly. How does this work? This is my penguin. I've done a sort of physiological thing. I'm going to remove the penguin. Here are the penguin guts. So we've got one scenario where the... Where is it? A bird's eating very few fish. Okay? It eats very little fish. It's going into the intestine. Come on, you can do this. Um, 
And because it's eating very little, there's a lot of cooking time. There's a lot of digesting time going on in the system and very little poo. And the trick is they take a lot of energy out of very few fish. So they're very, very efficient when they're eating few fish. The other option is, of course, where they, they do the Roman emperor stuffing themselves trick. Huge numbers of fish. The cooking time's really quick. Lots of poo. Uh, that's why penguin colonists can be messy. Um, and very little energy taken out per fish. So they're modulating their whole digestion, uh, digestive physiology according to the amount of fish they take. So the incredible thing about penguins is on Tuesday, when there's very few fish around, they eat few of those fish, because there are hardly any to eat anyway. They use uh, all the fish. They take a huge amount of energy out of each fish, and therefore they don't impact the stock, which is already quite little anyway. But then on Wednesday, piles of fish come in, or it could be the next year, and they, there's tons of fish, they eat lots of fish, they use very little energy from the fish, and they can impact the stock. So they're doing something really, automatically, they're doing something really clever. They're taking lots of food when it's abundant and very little when it's not. And this would be a wonderful thing if our fishing industry could do a similar sort of thing. All right. Understanding the amount of food that animals take and where they take it is fundamental to understanding their needs. And um, wandering albatrosses are perhaps one of the more tricky ones because they travel so far. We're involved in a project with Peter Ryan and Sylvie, well, Sylvie works with us, um, Peter Ryan from the Fitzpatrick Institute in South Africa, trying to look at where albatrosses feed, when they feed, how they feed, and in particular because this is someone having a stare-off with an albatross. Just to give you an idea how big they are, um, they've got an 11-foot wingspan, and there have been problems with albatrosses in the past, not just wandering albatrosses, but a lot of them because the, they take... Uh, hooks from the long line industry thinking their food. So it is important to know where they're taking food and how they take it and what's the natural food. So as part of this study, we were looking at, well, what goes on when a wandering albatross goes foraging for its chicks. This is a, a photo by David Camier, good pal, uh, from Jardin Japonais in Possession Island, French subantarctic islands. This is a colony, if you call it that, of wandering albatrosses. They've got their nests and their chicks. And what they do typically is they leave in the morning or they leave at some time and they'll spend six days at sea foraging, doing this albatross thing, hardly ever flapping, um, and finding food and then coming back. And then they'll, in a rather disgusting way, they'll regurgitate. They'll be sick for their chicks, which is a good thing if you're a chick. To give you an idea of how far they go, if you look at where it says nest 42, that's the nest 42, this is a an albatross that's Sylvie equipped, and it went almost up to South Africa on one of its foraging trips. So they're going a really long way, thousands of kilometres to eat. But that really doesn't help us understand where they're eating. Um, and so in order to get a, a handle on this, we decided we'll, we'll have a, another tag which goes with the daily diary, and it'll tell us when albatrosses are eating. And the way we did this is that, you see, that's gone blue. In the original PowerPoint, it's, got, it's pink to give you a feeling of sort of we're doing a cross-section through the body. But I'd like you to think pink now. Um, and what we did is we designed a, a pill, a temperature pill, which they swallowed, and it just recorded stomach temperature as well as all the other stuff from the Daily Diary. And the reason for that is albatrosses don't eat ice cream, um, but they do eat squid, and squid are cold, and so is ice cream, and therefore... If you take the squid, or if you swallow a squid, and you put it in the stomach, then the temperature pill will say, oh, the temperature's gone down, it's just eaten something. So that's the principle behind that. And using that principle, we can now look at a graph of stomach temperature against time in hours during foraging for a wandering albatross. So I've highlighted the daylight periods at the moment. And um, where you see these drops in temperature that's where it ate something. And what you can see from that is that, yeah, they're eating something every few hours, and this fits in what we think we understand about albatross prey, which is a lot of it is squid, and they're very rarely... They're, they're spaced a long way apart. Albatrosses, wandering albatrosses don't dive, and so they'll catch a squid here, and then they'll fly another 100 miles, and then find another one, because these squid are really rare. And that's fine. Everyone's happy with that. This is what they do at night, which is they just sit for most of the time on the water and therefore clearly can't be eating squid. So that's fine, sleeping albatross at night, 
just to check. We'll have a look what happens during the night periods, we'll get when they're asleep and not eating squid. And, oh dear, they're still eating squid at night and they're sitting on the sea. So, what? Uh, they're not sleeping? Um, someone's bringing them squid? Okay, this is where we need to look in finer detail at the albatross movement. And here's the night period. We're going to blow it up. And this is what it looks like. Crazy circle. So the albatross is sitting on the sea. They don't always do this. And going round, paddling, paddling around in ridiculously tight circles. See, look at the scale. This is in metres. And periodically eating squid. Not like spinning around in crazy circles is going to help you catch squid. Well, let me tell you what we think is happening. This is my representation. I, could, I just got so sick of PowerPoint, I can't make things spin properly, so I did it like this. This is a spinning albatross. And if you've ever had the fortune to work in an area that's highly productive, an ocean area that's highly productive, you can take your hand and you can, you can agitate the water and it will glow. Bioluminescence. There are beasts, plankton, effectively in the water that when they get agitated, say, I'm going to glow um, because I'm agitated. Um, and the, what we think is albatrosses do, the, do that. They go powering around in these circles and we think they produce, as they do so, light. And they make a ball of light. They do it all in one area. And that ball of light, if you're a squid, is compelling. So you can be much deeper than an albatross could possibly reach. And you say, oh, it's beautiful. It's light. And you swim up towards it and get eaten by the albatross. Um, so what we think albatrosses are actually doing is they're using natural bioluminescence to jig for squid using light. When, people, when we catch squid, we just turn on our spotlights and they come up, but albatrosses have been doing that for many years before we even invented electricity, so no wonder they're looking so smug. Um, albatrosses and squid and different places in the ocean are all part of what they need, but what would be a nice thing to know would be to know how the, how the animal perceives its environment, how the environment is impacting the animal in itself. And um, we had an interesting lead into this of how animals feel about their life situation in a study that we did with Joseph Saltis from Disneyland in, in the States and working with elephants. And we put daily diaries on captive elephants and we started to look at the sort of patterns we get out from the tag that tell us about the different behaviours. And in tandem with this, we'd been chatting with Ian Douglas Hamilton, the elephant bloke, who's very worried about the status of elephants in Africa. Um, African elephants. But they've got these teeth that people seem to like to have for trinkets, which is unfortunate if you're an elephant. Um, and Ian Douglas Hamilton says, well, everybody knows about elephants. An elephant never forgets. They're very old. They have good memories. And he says, yes, yes, they do have good memories. And what he believes is that Elephants, when they walk in particular areas where they've been walking in war zones, they get really nervous about it. They've been in war zones in the past. They think, this is not a good place to be. I'm a nervous elephant. And in terms of habitat quality, it's important to know this. And what came out of the study with Joseph um, Saltis when we put these tags on is that just these captive animals, the tag was recording all these various parameters... And if you look at an elephant walking along, well, I'm very bad at doing elephant walks, but, you know, it's just an elephant walk, and, and uh, you'd think it doesn't change an awful lot. And indeed, as far as I can see, elephant walks don't change an awful lot. But if you do it with an elephant and look at the way it walks according to the tag when it's walking towards food, then it, it's different to when it's walking away from food. So the elephant is sort of saying, yeah, I'm having some hay. And, then it's, and when it's had its hay, it's saying, oh, I've had the hay. Um, uh, the point about it is, is that this is starting to allude to how animals feel about things, and that's very important. It's not just about elephants. It's about, well, how do moose feel about having a new highway or an oil pipeline? And so there's some really interesting things coming out of this, out of this work that are actually going to tell us about how they feel about the environment and how we change it. OK, very quickly, um, the chill factor. The last case, how do we rehabilitate sloths? Okay. This is Costa Rica, a beautiful place. This is the Sloth Sanctuary run by Judy. And um, she has people working to rehabilitate sloths. Sloths are extraordinary animals. Before I fought, saw my first sloth, somebody told me about a story where she said, <clears throat> Sabrina Fossette, driving along the road in French Guiana, 
and she was driving along in a, in a Land Rover and, and she drove past something that looked a bit like a roadkill and she went along and said, stop 200 yards down there and she said, I wonder what that was. I just put it in reverse and reversed up to it. And it was a sloth crossing the road. And by the time she got back to it, it had just got into the, oh no, I'm going to be hit by a car mode. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Actually, they're not quite that slow, but um, they are extraordinary animals. And one of the things about the sloths and one of the reasons that Judy and her team are rehabilitating them is they're they're, they electrocute themselves from pylons that we hang through the jungle, and why wouldn't they climb on them? And they're misused by some of the people, and so she picks them up and wants to rehabilitate them and put them back out in the jungle. This is a two-fingered sloth. I know it says two-toed, but actually they're two-fingered. Um, and, and this is a three-fingered sloth. We do know that sloths are really extraordinary animals. They do do everything slowly. And they eat very toxic vegetation and very strange vegetation. That makes rehabilitation difficult because if you get it wrong, then you're in trouble. The other thing about sloths, which you can mull over at the end of this, is they come down once every seven days to the jungle floor to poo. Um, And no one really knows why they do that. Why don't they just poo upstairs? It's a dangerous place to be. Um, But with Becky Cliff, Rebecca Cliff, who's starting her PhD at Swansea with us, in September, and who's been working at this sloth sanctuary in Costa Rica um, previously. In any case, we're putting daily diaries on these animals. Importantly, when on the wild animal, but also on animals that are being released, because they can tell us how released animals have been doing, and do we need to change something about the way we're treating them? And of course, this becomes particularly critical when sloths are born in captivity and they're supposed to be released. I got the sort of R vibe, and I like that, because this sloth they've called Rory. So uh, um, the sloth is the one at the top there. Um, <laughs> but particularly important when, you're, when you have animals born in captivity and have to be released. And so, um, obviously, you want to know how well they're doing. And this isn't just about sloths, either. This is about all sorts of animals that all sorts of zoos might be re- releasing. So I'm going to close the book there for you, because I've run out of time. But if there's a message to take home, I suppose, the first thing is that we're changing the environment as we've never changed it before. And that's sort of worrying and different. But in our own way, we're creating capacity for technology and for technological advances that gives us a greater capacity for studying what animals need than we ever had before. And I I feel privileged to be part of the Swansea team working on this. And I really think that we can do something Uh, seriously important for general conservation and for helping everyone understand how this whole environment animal thing fits together. So thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes left for questions. Um, We've got a couple of roving mics around, so if you put your hands up, we'll uh, try and get through as many as possible. Uh, I think just in the middle there, we'll start. What's your favourite animal? The penguin is, is a simple answer to that. I got obsessed with penguins when I was four, and I've been obsessed with them ever since. And if you ask me which penguin, the chinstrap penguin. And they're very cool animals. Look them up on, on, on the web. Really nice animals. Um, if you've got... You're getting all this information about how the, what's being done to the animal's environment is affecting the animals, which is obviously of great importance. How readily are the authorities listening to what you're saying when you pass that information on to them, i.e., are they prepared to do things to protect the environment in the way that you feel is necessary? That's, I mean, that depends entirely on, on the animal and on the environment. It's a, it's a whole political issue, what can be done about the various cases. Uh, the, the, the starting point, though, and the, the political issues often blow up because of lack of information. And probably some people say, we think it's this, and other people think we say it's that. The position we're in is our expertise is in finding out the closest we can get to the truth so that we can inform bodies. So there's no easy answer to that, but the, the foundation to any sort of changes in the environment have, has to be really tight science. Good for the gentleman up at the back, and then you, sir. What's the most dangerous animal you've encountered? Encountered or tagged? Uh, any. Okay, well, t- encountered was when I was in Ningalo Reef and I, and I went uh, for a swim near the shore. And I was just... The Australians are very... 
they're very blasé about death. Uh, and they've got lots of hideous killing animals in their, in their country. Um, and I felt a little out of my depth when I was there because uh, I didn't want to appear to be a wimp. You know, you're the British wimp um, sort of thing. And I went swimming near the shore and quite a big shark came swimming along next to me. It was probably about 12 feet long. And I looked at it and thought, hmm, it's got teeth. And there are some of my pals on the shore there. Uh, If I get out, will they think I'm a wimp? And I thought, well, I'm going to get out. I'm just going to get out. And I was standing on the beach and um, Tim came along. And and he said to me, I thought you wanted to go for a swim. And I said, yeah, but there's a sort of big fish teeth thing. He said, what did it look like? He said, sort of blotches on its side. He said, oh, it's a tiger shark. Good job you got out of the water, mate. So, (laughs) so, yeah, that's probably the most dangerous thing. Um, Um, So, uh, in the technology of your tags, do you use satellite technology either for position or for sending information back to your computers? Um, We use satellite technology sometimes together with the daily diary for satellite technology for putting a GPS enhanced fix in. So we use it in that sense for transmitting data back. There's no way we can use satellite technology because the quantities of data we pick up are humongous and the satellite doesn't cope with that. So we we might take a tag back that's been on an animal for a week and there may be 100 million data points. And so we, we just can't do that. And, and the idea behind the tag is, at least in the initial stages, it's fully autonomous. So the animal can do what it wants. It can go down to a kilometre underwater or go into, deep into the earth or in a forest, and the tag will continue to record for us instead of saying, I can't do anything if it comes to a satellite. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it uh, possible to carry out some study like this on the River Y on a salmon? On salmon. It's interesting you should say that because... One of the people in our team, Carlos Garcia de Leonitz, from Swansea University in Biosciences, he's a salmon expert, he's a world salmon expert, and one of the things we've been talking about, and we will be doing, is equipping salmon with these tags. In particular, the specific case we're interested in is how hard are they finding it to get back to the rivers, up the rivers, where they want to spawn, because we've changed the course of the river, we put weirs in and things like that, and, and we even put fish ladders, so they're supposed to be able to get up easily, but whether it's easy or not, we don't really know, and we can put tags on and find out. Yeah. Uh, yeah sorry to, to hog the um, questions, but on the why, it's quite um, important possibly to try to establish whether the salmon are going up and down, and how the canoeing recreational activity is impacting on their behaviour. So it is a specific um, question to whether it would be possible for me to contact you to ask whether you would be able to set up a study on the why. On the why? Well, I would, I would immediately say, well, let's talk with Carlos about it. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting point, and that is animals in general and how much we affect animals, uh, you can study very well with these tags. So you can put tags on animals, and then people can come swim by or canoe by or just approach them, and we can pick up whether how, because of this whole how stressed are animals, we can pick up this vibe effectively say no no you shouldn't be going closer than 20 meters to a penguin for example and it's very useful for informing conservation measures or ecotourism measures and stuff like that so yeah i think we've got a question from the gentleman at the back what's the weirdest animal you've seen that has to be the human um, <laughs> uh, um but if you want another answer sloths are pretty weird <laughs> You've mentioned just now that a tag was on for a week. Is this the normal length of time, or does it depend on the animal? It depends on the animal, and it depends on the question. Um, the, one of the difficulties we have, I suppose, at the moment is the longer you leave it on, the more likely it is to fall off, or the animal won't come back, or something will malfunction or something. So we tend to work for period, extending periods. We can, you, know, you can put a tag on an elephant for a year, an elephant seal for six months, seven months. Our normal working period, because we get so much information, is usually a few days or a week or a couple of weeks. But, um, yeah, it's, it sort of depends. When we first did the whale shark stuff, we'd never put a tag on a whale shark before like this. And we had a... It was scheduled to release after three days. Um, and we put it on and we followed the whale shark for a while and then they disappeared. And it came up after 40 minutes and Adrian was there and Brad was there. And they said, well, what do we do now? What, you know, it's, it's only been wearing it for 40 minutes. We could, we could pull the tag off. And I said, pull it off. Because if it disappears and we never see it again, 
then we'll have no data on a whale shark. We can take this tag off, we'll have 40 minutes, which will be interesting, and then we can put a tag on another whale shark. So, so that's the sort of crazy minimum periods we've ever done. But um, <clears throat> it's better to work up from small periods to longer periods than try and go for a long period and all your eggs are in one basket and then you don't have a basket. And the gentleman at the back. Um, I was just wondering how much research that take from animals that can then be applied to humanities. For example, you talked about the parabolic flight of birds. Can we then apply that to a commercial aircraft? I mean, it might be a bit odd that we power up and then glide down, but can yes. we do that kind of stuff? There's a, my initial reaction to that is I'd be really sick. Um, but uh, th there is a whole branch of, so of biology, bioscience, which is uh, dependent on looking at the way animals operate and and saying we can use this to build things, to improve things for ourselves. An example of that is a pal of mine, Rudiger Banash, who's a German, and he was doing some experiments on penguins. Uh, to, well, we were doing it together in Berlin, and they have a big water flume, and, and we put model penguins in this water flume, and we were measuring the drag. And the, the Germans, with all the measuring systems, they normally use it for miniature ships. They had this sort of Star Trek control panel, and they were measuring away, and, uh, and they said... This can't be right. You know, the drag coefficient's really low. This is impossible. We don't get drag coefficients this low. Recalibrate. Do it again. So we spent the whole day redoing it and doing it again. And at the end of the day, came out with the observation that the shape of a penguin has the lowest drag coefficient of anybody anywhere ever created. And so Rudy Banesh then took this piece of information to a Zeppelin company, and they made a huge penguin-shaped zeppelin, which they drove around over Berlin, and actually with penguin colours as well. So, um, <clears throat> so, yes, there's plenty of opportunity for that. And, uh, I think we've got a gentleman over here. In terms of the um, interpretation of the data you get from the tags, it would seem to me that having a video feed of it would make things considerably easier. Is that something you're looking at pursuing? Yes. It, it, you know, it's one of the most useful things about being able to do virtual reality is if you're a scientist and you're breaking your head open on all these funny traces, you can say, I don't know, just, I just want to see it. And, and that's definitely something that's very powerful. And what we would like to do is something we're looking into exploring is putting traces of animals, maybe we could put them in Google Earth with this sort of technology so that members of the public could say, I really would like to see what a whale shark does or a sperm whale does at the bottom of the, bottom of the dive. And you could click on it and you could fly around it uh, and you direct yourself behind it or in front, uh, or if, if you're brave, do it in front of a great white, um, but uh, so that people get a real impression of what's going on. So not a still and not footage a la BBC where it's always the same footage. You can look at it tomorrow from above the surface or below, and we think that's very exciting. And I think there's someone in the middle here. How often do you go to a, a different place to go and tag or look at a different animal? Uh, as often as the university lets me. No, that's not true. Um, what I, my specialist area is penguins. So if you've got any questions that keep you awake at night about penguins, catch me afterwards and I'll tell you. But what we tend to do within the group is if there's a new area, I often go out and, and, and play with whoever our experts, expert abroad is, all these people we work with abroad, and... Um, and, and have the first cut, as it were, with some other person who's going to be doing it as a PhD or it's going to be in the specialist area. I haven't answered your question yet, but it'll be two or three times a year that I get, get out. It could be much more, but again, you know, I have to teach and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm head of department. That's, it's not a nice thing. And I've lost sight of the person. Where, oh, yeah, just there. Are great whites as dangerous as they seem to be? Um, I went to a talk once in, in Monterey, Monterey in, in the States, and someone was giving a talk and they were saying, I don't think great whites are that dangerous. Um, I've swum with them quite a lot and they've got, just got this bad, bad kid image and da da da. And a bloke in the audience, a German chap who's actually working in a, in a company that makes technologies to tag animals, leapt up and he said, this is all nonsense. I want to show you what happened with the great white shark. And he ripped his shirt open and he had this huge bite out of him. So my view on great whites is I don't care what anyone else thinks. If there's one in the water, I will not be in the water with it. 
Um, the lady over here. Um, I don't know if you touched on it in the beginning, but uh, do you experience like any sort of segregation with the animals, with the tags? I know in society, if you're different, sometimes you can experience this. But... Oh, you mean because they're wearing the tags, other animals say you're wearing a tag, you're hideous? Yeah. That sort of thing. Um, it is interesting because animals are... Um, you can see this effect, for example, oiled penguins. When oiled penguins come in, they have a, they're, they're already feeling horrible, and they come and they land on the, on the shore. And you can have a beach group of penguins, and they're all non-oiled, and there's the, you know, where Carl is there, there's the oiled penguin. And then you'll see a bird that's just sitting there meditating, and he'll just get up and think, he's hideous, and go over right the way around the thing, and then peck him, um, because he looks different. Um, and so... You can get the same phenomenon with tags, and particularly if you make a tag so that it doesn't really fit on the animal well. So that's why the colour's important. It's not just about, oh, I'm a penguin, they put a red tag on my back. Um, I don't like red. They are supposed to be black on their backs, and that's why um, we put black tags. But also because not just animals from the same species, but if you put a red tag on a penguin's back because it's easier for you to see, oh, he's come back, there's the red tag... Things like skewers that like to eat penguins say, he's bleeding already, I'm going to have him. And so they come in and give them a hard time. So it's really important to, to make the tags so they minimally impact the animal wearing them, which is the main problem, but also so that anything around them doesn't, doesn't uh, have an easy time eating them or get upset by them. Time for one more question, if anyone... Has not yet done at the front here? So you have all this data... Do, is your primary purpose conservation, or what's your one, two, three raise on DETRA? Um, the dream, you've got to know what the dream is. The dream is to be able to take all the information from these tags and put them in a World Heritage Repository. We know we're near that now. But it would be lovely to think, any time, anybody on the planet, and we're trying to make these these daily diaries accessible to as many people as possible, could say, yes, I've used this tag. Um, it gives me enough information to be able to say exactly what this animal has done. We're going to put it in this world library so that when the situation happens and the thingamy jobs or whatever they are outside your kitchen window start to disappear, uh, you can say, well, what was happening to them 10 years ago? What was going well? What were they doing? And what are they doing now? And what is different? And how can we change that? So the idea is not just about rushing around and putting tags on animals that are in the process of disappearing to find out what the problem is, although we do a lot of that. The idea is to just figure out what animals need, even when they're having a good time. Because so often we say, well, what happened to the dodo? You know, it... It was there before. I know, I know we shot them or killed them or did whatever, but the, the principle should be that we should know what the norm is, what the good things are for these animals. And that really is, I suppose, the dream, is to be able to facilitate that process. And I'm afraid that's us out of time, but I'm sure you'll agree it's been an absolutely fascinating talk. Please, once again, put your hands together for Rory Wilson. Thank you.